It's June 2014 and sitting with me here is uh, Paul Byrne who's uh, worked on Mercury for the past three or four years but Paul you've just recently moved to the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston to start a project on icy moons. Now please tell us Paul what it is about icy moons that uh, intrigues you. Well there's, there's the biggest thing that I find interesting about icy moons is that we have these solid surface bodies but they're not made of rock. They're not made of what we're used to seeing in terms of Mercury, Moon, Mars, or our own planet Earth. These are things that are made of ice. They have icy shells. And so, on the one hand, they might be very similar. They're subject to very similar processes like impact cratering. On the other hand, the fact that they're made of a different material means they might express that, those processes in different ways. So I'm really interested by what the commonalities are and what the differences are. But although it's ice, it doesn't really behave like glacier ice would on the Earth, does it? Because it's, it's so cold, that's the main reason. Right, so this ice is super solid because it's essentially exposed to the vacuum of space. So we have a process on icy moons, for example, that we tend not to observe on the rocky bodies, which is that if you have an impact crater, over time that crater will relax. It basically, the floor rebounds very slightly because the ice is flowing very, very slowly, but over a long enough time that crater starts to get softened and almost disappears. That's a process we don't really see on the rocky bodies. Bodies. So that makes it even harder to understand how impact cratering shapes these things. That's an, a, an example of one of the primary differences between ice and rock and how it behaves. Um, but there's a similarity as well, isn't there? Because the, the ice can melt in ways very, very similar to how mixtures of silicate minerals can melt. What can you tell us about that? Absolutely. In fact, we even have a special word for it, cryovolcanism. So the idea is that stuff can come out of the ground, out of the icy shell, or it can be melted when an asteroid or comet strikes the surface. And this material is essentially liquid, so it's almost like ice lava. And it pours out and it can resurface or cover over features just the way silicate lava does on Earth. But, but the ice isn't necessarily water, is it? There are other materials contributing to the ice? That's right. So most of what we assume it is is to be water ice, but there's lots of other different uh, compounds mixed in, like ammonia ice or methane ice, for example. We think that a lot of Titan's crust, for example, is composed of methane ice. So because you have very low temperatures and very different conditions out there, you start getting very exotic mixtures of material that the likes you don't see in the inner solar system. Okay, so with all these icy moons, Paul, which ones are you going to get cracking on first and why? Okay, so we've got two works starting off with in parallel for two different projects. The first one is Enceladus. Enceladus is very small, it's not much bigger than uh, Great Britain. But what's interesting about Enceladus is that it has active volcanism or cryovolcanism happening today. On its south pole, there's a bunch of jets shooting material out into space, and some people have gotten very excited at the prospect that these might be related to life or you may have the conditions that might be you know, amenable to life inside Enceladus. So it's a place of great study right now. And what I'm going to be trying to do is work out what the rate of resurfacing of this stuff that's coming out and falling back down onto the surface of Enceladus is that might tell us something about how long these jets have been active for. How much of this stuff on Enceladus falls back and how much is lost to space? Because the gravity on Enceladus is pretty weak, isn't it? It is, and that's one of the things we're going to try and figure out. How much of the resurfacing, how much of what we see on the surface around these vents is due to resurfacing this material falling back? We know a bit falls back because when we look at the surface of Enceladus with colour data, we see there are different colours right where we predict this material to fall back. But it occurs in two bands. It's not all over the place and we don't know the volume of it. So that's one of the key questions. If we can work out the volume of it, we might have a sense to how long that process has been going, how long those jets have been active. Yeah, because Enceladus is more active than some people would say it can sustain in the long term, isn't it? That's the belief, yeah. So most of the time, certainly on Earth, the volcanic activity we see on Earth is largely because we have plate tectonics. There's a great deal of heat in the mantle that drives the motion of our tectonic plates. But that heat comes from radioactive decay of elements inside Earth. There's no way we have that amount of material in something as small as Enceladus. So one of the theories is that it's subject to gravitational perturbation through other moons and interacting uh, with Saturn, squeezing it back and forth. That might be causing the melting of material at death and blasting it out through these vents. Okay. So so tidal heating, essentially. That's essentially what so, we think it is. And apart from Enceladus, what's your next uh, target? So we're also going to be looking at Dione. Dione is a, one of the larger icy moons in, in the Saturnian system. And Dione has these great big rift zones, these big cracks in its icy shell. 
And so what we want to figure out is, well, A, what process caused this? And B, is this process we see active on the other icy moons, the other big moons in Saturn's uh, moon system? So we're going to be looking at Dione, mapping everything out there. So that's like tectonic analysis. It contrasts from the volcanic stuff on Enceladus. But then we're going to be seeing if we can identify those same patterns of deformation on other moons like Tethys, Mimas and Rhea. That's great. Well, Paul, I'll try and catch up with you in a couple of years' time and find out how things are going. Cool. I look forward to Dave. Cheers.